even if you're not directly involved in a project, it's always sad to see a long-running project die, especially a long-running project that has ties to the earliest days of Linux, and the Fun2 Linux project is absolutely no exception. All good things must come to an end by Daniel Robbins, the Fun2 Linux BDFL. I've decided to end the Fun2 Linux project, Fun2 started as a philosophy to create a fun community of contributors building something great together. For me, it's no longer that, so I need to move on to other things. There is not a successor BDFL for Fun2, nor am I interested in trying to find one or hand the project off to someone else. You can expect the project to wind down through August if you have a Fun2 container. It will continue to be online through the end of August, so you have time to find another hosting solution if you need one. A Fun2 container is one of the ways the project was funding itself, basically providing some of their compute infrastructure at a cost so you can run a virtual private server. I know that something like this might be a challenge and difficult to maintain, but it would be interesting to see a project actually experiment with this. At a very surface level, as the name suggests, Fun2 is a Gen2 Linux based distro, following what Daniel would describe as the Wolf Pack philosophy. Now, <laughs> I'm not making this up. This is the way it is actually described. In the Fun2 community, we are all users of Fun2. Even the BDFL considers himself to be a user of Fun2 first and foremost. Sometimes we may put on our developer hat and contribute an improvement or bug fix to Fun2 Linux, but we never lose our connection to the reality that we are users of Fun2. That keeps us grounded and is important. Below you will learn the philosophy of how our pack functions, which will assist you in becoming a happy and productive wolf. As a wolf, a member of the fun to use the community. See, I'm not making this up. This is what it actually says. A wolf is authentic. We avoid the overdeveloped, sanitized, and boring and isolated prepackaged world where disconnected users simply consume what was pre made for them. A wolf is mindful of the pack. Tackling distro problems as a community rather than just relying on local hacks. A wolf is interconnected. We aren't lone animals. We live in a pack. We support the community. We raise up the younger members of the pack to make them strong, fierce members of the pack. A wolf is selective. We don't just accept what is handed to us. If that solution is good, then we'll use it, but we decide if it fits into fun to. Let's find the optimal solution. We would rather hunt. A wolf hunts. <laughs> if no solution exists, we will make the solution ourselves. We will track something down and find what we need to find. A wolf is territorial. We do welcome everyone. However, we know what we can handle, we know how much we can handle, and we will claim the new territory as our pack grows. A wolf owns their shit. If we make a mistake, we will own up to that mistake. We will fix that mistake and we'll make sure it doesn't happen again. A wolf howls. We encourage members of the community to get involved in the project. We don't care about things unrelated to the project. We don't care if maybe, ah, uh, you don't have that much experience. Everybody can get involved. There's always going to be a place for you. Now that's the whole funny community stuff. In the past, there were a lot more in the way of technical differences between Fun2 and Gen2. Nowadays though, a lot of that stuff has been kind of ironed out as Gen2 has become a little bit friendlier to work with. Now, whilst Fun2 was a relatively small project, there is a reason why I'm talking about it. Its legacy stretches back way, way back in Linux time. Who is Daniel Robbins? Well, after working on a project called Stampede Linux and FreeBSD, in 1999, he founded his own distro, a little known project called Enoch Linux. I'd be very surprised if any of you had heard of it, at least by that name. 
it only had one version known to have been released. However, three years later, he started another project which was basically just a rebrand of Enoch Linux. That project was called Gen2 Linux. So, if he founded Gen2 Linux, what is he doing over here in this random other little project called Fun2? Well, there is a very fun story here. Fun2 Technologies, the organization also founded by Daniel that presides over the Fun2 project, was founded in 2006. Initially, though, as a consulting firm. Following this, in 2008, the Fun2 Linux project was founded but not before a ton of drama happening in Gen 2 between 2002 and 2008. Now, this might seem weird in a modern context with Ubuntu, Fedora, all of these other distros available, but when Gen 2 first came out, this was two years before Ubuntu, the Linux community was very, very different then, and it saw great success and great interest in the Linux community of the time, at the time, being one of the fastest growing Linux distros. With this obviously comes some additional challenges, but also a massive opportunity. An opportunity to form a business around the Gen2 Linux project. Now at this point, the Gen2 foundation had not yet been formed. So Daniel's kind of just trying to work out what he wanted to do with the project. And at the time, a lot of people really struggled to build businesses in the Linux space because, frankly, there just wasn't that many people interested in Linux. Yes, it was gaining a lot of traction in the web space, but if we're talking about a desktop project, this was before Ubuntu. And thank God that OS News was around in 2002 and still has all of their old interviews. Here is one with Gen 2's Daniel Robbins. Is Gen2 going to sell its own ISO CDs and become a fully commercial company, or are you going to stay largely community-based? Hopefully something in between. I never want to compromise our free software development principles in order to make money, nor do I want to put our project in a position where we attempted to compromise our principles in order to make money, as many companies are. We certainly don't want to try to fit the mold of companies like Red Hat and Mandrake just because that's the distro way. We want to choose our own path and find a healthy synergy between developing free software and growing a business based around Gen2. I very much want to find a way to turn the Gen2 Linux project into a profitable enterprise. Now this didn't end up happening, and I wouldn't be surprised if it was part of the reason that in 2004, he decided to resign from the project, but he didn't want to completely abandon the project. When he did this, he set up something that still stands today, the Gen2 Foundation, and made the project a true community-run project. At least he thought at the time, and we'll get to that in just a bit. When he did this, he really intended to step away from the project, handing over all copyrights and trademarks to the project over to the Gen2 Foundation. At this point, he wasn't the owner of the project anymore, the Gen2 Foundation was. Now in 2005, he stepped away from Linux for a bit, but not away from open source. Daniel got himself a job over at Microsoft. Now, when this happened, because Gen2 was still very, very big of a distro, this got a bit of attention from people in the tech space. There was an article from CNET about this. There was also a post, of course, over on Slashdot. But people were like, why is the Gen2 guy over at Microsoft? Now, he had an explanation for why he was doing this. He says to help Microsoft to understand open source and community-based projects. Whilst nowadays as a whole, Microsoft loves open source, and you have people in the FOSS space actually defending Microsoft. That was not the case back then. People hated Microsoft in 2004 for good reason. Microsoft hated them as well. Then, in January of 2006, he decided to leave Microsoft due to frustrations with a lack of utilization of his technical skills. Having left Microsoft, 
he wasn't done with Gen 2, in August of 2006, he decided to get back involved again after someone had requested he take a look at some issues. And one anonymous user really predicted what was going to happen next. I'm curious of your views of the various directions that Gen 2 has taken since you left as lead developer. Anything that sticks out in your mind as totally dumb or smart or unexpected that turned out pretty cool or bad. Keep that in mind. Now sadly, a lot of Gen 2 stuff of the time didn't properly get archived, so a lot of the stuff I'm going to mention is secondary accounts, articles, and things like that, not directly from the mailing list. So Daniel officially became a developer again on the AMD64 team in February of 2007, before once again stepping away from the project in March of 2007. So he was doing a couple of patches here and there. Then a month after officially becoming a developer again, he was done. This was due to getting into a flame war with not an active maintainer, but a former maintainer. Now previously the Gen 2 developer mailing lists were only for Gen 2 developers. If you were not a developer, you were not going to be involved in them. And Daniel wasn't really happy to see this change. He was like, why are non-developers in this list? And ultimately, after getting into an argument with this guy, tried to call for him to be banned. And the maintainers of the list were like, no, this guy was a good maintainer when he was a maintainer. Yes, you're the guy who started the project, but you've been gone for all of these years, so... Is not our problem anymore. Like, you go away. Here is not the chat log itself, but an artistic representation of what went on in the log. Basically, the guy was kind of trolling Daniel. Daniel didn't want him to be in the list. And, uh, yeah, after pushing his buttons a bunch, he probably shouldn't have been in the list anyway. But after pushing his buttons a bunch, Daniel was just sick of him, they wouldn't get rid of him, so he left himself. Now being the creator of the project, Daniel's situation was certainly the biggest of the time. A lot of people talking about who was in the right, who was in the wrong, but a thread that seemed to go through a lot of it is this was not a one-time situation. Yes, Daniel's was the biggest, but a lot of other people felt a very similar way about Gen 2 and didn't feel like the project had been in a healthy state ever since Daniel had left and it had only been sliding. This was described very well in a piece from DistroWatch back in 2007. If a person who repeatedly engages in personal attacks against other developers is permitted to remain within the project, then there is something wrong with the way the distribution is managed. Yes. Disagreeing with other developers on organizational and technical matters is perfectly fine. Launching personal attacks against anybody who has a different idea is not. We see an awful lot of disagreements on the Debian developers mailing list as well, but rarely if ever we see such staunch personal attacks as we've been seeing on the Gen 2 developers mailing lists. Conflicts and disagreements are a natural part of any large and democratic organization. Ironically, it was Daniel Robbins who first pointed out the dangers of working with freaks as he called them, in his article, Making the Distribution, where he describes some of the events that eventually led to the collapse of Stampede Linux. Many other open source projects also suffer from large scale flame wars from time to time. The Linux kernel is a good example. However, what distinguishes Gen2 from other such projects is the fact that it doesn't have a mechanism to deal with poisonous individuals. Or to be more precise, the existing mechanism do not work, since the present structures don't have the necessary powers to be effective in solving conflicts. As a result, over the past few years, Gen2 Linux has degenerated into a loose structure that is increasingly run by a small, power-hungry clique that resents any attempt to change the current status quo. Whilst all this was going on, there was a funny event off to the side. In 2004, Daniel had meant to hand everything off to the Gentoo Foundation. The copyrights, the trademarks, all that fun stuff. What he forgot to do is, um, and he didn't realize this until 2007, 
is he forgot to hand off the Gen 2 Foundation and legally on paper, he was still the president. Now in most other cases, people would say, this is terrible. What happened here? How could he still be the president? <laughs> Here's the thing. Gen 2 was so screwed at the time, people were like, no! Daniel, don't hand off the foundation. We need you. Stay the president. Fix the project. Fix Gen 2. It's completely screwed. We need somebody to put these people back in place. Gen 2 needs you. Please come back. Gen 2 needs you. It needs a great leader. Please exercise your rediscovered status as the president of the foundation to help improve things. That wasn't his plan, though. He had planned to step away from the project and clearly... People in the project didn't want him to be there, like people who were actually maintaining and developing the project. So, look, yes, he could have legally taken over the project if he wanted to, but he decided against doing so. Instead, what he did in 2008 is he began work on the Fun2 Linux distro. I have a lot of technical goals for Fun2, but the primary goal of Fun2 as a free software project is to create an environment where I can happily work on Gen2 related and non-Gen2 related technical efforts in a way that's compatible with my personal life and have it be Fun2. In the sense, the name Fun2 is sort of a play on words on Gen2, where Fun2 is sort of my own personal Gen2 that's also fun. And that should better explain why the project is over. The whole goal of it was to create Gen 2, but allow him to have fun again. And if he's no longer having fun, the project doesn't really make any sense anymore. It was never intended to be this competitor to Gen 2 that became this big community. It was always meant to be something that he could just enjoy hacking on. And for all these years, that is what it was. But he's decided that for whatever reason, now is time to step away from the project. Now the project is done. It's over. And it's time to move on to new things in life and have some fun somewhere else. And I don't think there is any single one event that caused this. But it's probably just a build up of things over the years. Here's a recent example back in December of last year or November of last year where someone was just done with Fun2, they didn't really think things were working that well, they had a lot of problems with it, and frankly didn't word things that well, and he kind of got into like a little back and forth with this person and like a bit of frustration, I get it, right? If you've been working on something for a long time, there's going to come a point where you're just kind of done dealing with people, and... It's good to get to that point before, once again, you have another giant flame war and, you know, you end up making yourself sadder than you really need to be. End on a high note before things get really bad. That's probably a good way to do it. But what do you think? Were you a fun to user? Did you know about this news happening? Are you disappointed with it? I would love to know. So if you liked the video, go like the video. And if you really liked the video and you want to become one of these amazing people over here, check out the Patreon scrubs, the Vero Pay link in the description down below. I, the below? Whatever, we're going to say it like that. Uh, I hope you enjoyed learning a bit about Lin Linux and Gen 2 history. And um, yeah, these videos are always fun to make.